pleased to welcome you today to the guest lecture by Joseph Hartnitzka. And above all, I welcome Joseph. We are very happy that you will give a lecture with us today. It is um, probably the first lecture on Czech poetry at our Forschungskolleg. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to get an insight into recent Czech poetry. And now, first, I would like to introduce you briefly. Joseph is an associate professor at Charles University in Prague. He is a specialist in the theory of lyric historical poetics. Other main research areas are the 19th century novel and the theory of the essay. He teaches comparative literature and lyric theory. He's also the editor of the scholarly journal Svet Literatur, the world of literature. Joseph published three monographs in Czech in 2008, so translation into English, Images of the World in Czech Literature, Studies on the Moods of the Whole. And 2017, he published Poetry and Cosmos, Studies on Poetry and Poetics. And most recently in the last year, Poetry in Exile, Czech Poets During the Cold War and the Western Poetic Tradition. Furthermore, he translated several books of philosophy and he's also a poet, published three books of poetry and essays. Today, he gives a lecture on the topic, the return of old poet, that means on old age in Czech poetry after 1989. So I will now hand over to Joseph. Thank you very much, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's nice opportunity to speak before this international audience. Uh, I, I will start the presentation uh, with some Oh, yes, it's, do you see the presentation? All is okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to address here a particular situation in poetry, which I have called the return of old poets. Something like this, like this is quite evident in Czech poetry after 1989, but uh, comparable examples can be found elsewhere. Uh, and the point is uh, that just this one phenomenon uh, can say something about poetry in general. Uh, to begin, I would like to sketch more general frame, frame uh, together with few colleagues of mine, we are dealing with the topic uh, of poetry of the state of exception or emergency. Uh, the concept is loosely inspired by Giorgio Agamben, but I will leave the theoretical background aside for today. Uh, in short, we are interested in cases where poetry is created or read under not normal conditions. Uh, we are starting in this project uh, from the situation of Czech poetry uh, as it was experienced after the, after the onset of communism and which lasted until 1989. Uh, in this time, many poets were unable to publish and their work was practically Uh, inaccessible to common readers for many years. A lot of poets found themselves in exile. Some important books of poetry were written in prison in very harsh conditions. Uh, what I can focus on today uh, is especially poets who were unable to publish for several decades or only to a minimal extent and only after 1989 uh, did their poems become publicly available. The topic 
is basically characterized by two features. Firstly, these are poets of an older age after some years in different state. And secondly, they have returned to the public after a long enforced interruption during which they wrote, but could not publish uh, in Czechoslovakia. And their contacts with the general reader was zero or very limited. Similar cases can be found in other literatures, of course, uh, of especially of the so-called Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, at the same time, the situation was slightly different in each of the Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, Czesław Milos or Joseph Brodsky, for example, returned to readers as famous authors who are noticed by Western public and are also known at home because of uh, this international reputation. There was no such poet in uh, Czech Republic or Bohemia. Uh, and there was a rather strict uh, prohibition of publication for some authors. So many authors seem to have really disappeared uh, for many years. Whereas in Poland or for example, or communication with the exile was much more open. And even in Slovakia, which uh, the, the prohibitions was not so, were not so strict, even though Slovakia was one country with uh, today's Czech Republic. One example, Ivan Givish, about whom I will speak later, uh, was one of the best known Czech poets of the younger and middle generation uh, before his emigration in 1968. But after 1989, he was virtually unknown to younger readers, even though he published in exile. There have been a number of similar comebacks, of course. Uh, I will proceed in three uh, points or chapters. Firstly, I briefly address the question of, of what the state of exception and normality are and or can be in poetry and why this is an interesting topic, for example, theoretically. Uh, next, I will say something about the topic of old age in poetry. And finally, I would discuss selected Czech poets who are returning to the public and at an older age after a forced hiatus. Uh, we all know the state of emergency or exception today from our own experience. Although the communist era lasted, I hope, a little longer than the COVID. Above all, it is not at all clear how to understand the state of exception in poetry or for poetry. It is just the influence of the political situation or external, external conditions more generally, or does it make sense to speak about such a state which is specific to poetry? Not to mention that we can see poetry as closely connected to politics, even though politics doesn't need its poetry very much. Uh, provisionally, we can define as normal a situation in which poet has the opportunity to publish and perform publicly before an audience, which he or she considers to be his or her own. Uh, usually, uh, this public is united with the poet by the same language, country of origin, etc. But it's not necessary. The exceptional state of poetry would then be defined by a situation where such normality of literary life is interrupted or disrupted. But it is evident that normality means something different for poetry than it does for the life of uh, society 
there are no laws that guarantee any rights for poetry. But there are, of course, human rights. And a number of works have been produced that belong to the foundations of poetry, which are uh, canonic, just in situation that we might describe as exceptional, such as exile, imprisonment, the prohibition to publish, the so-called inner exile or inner emigration, etc. Ovid's poem of exile, Boetius' consolation of philosophy, which incorporates some uh, poetry. Uh, these are some examples. In Czech literature is uh, very interesting the case of Jan Zahradniček, who wrote uh, under very harsh conditions in prison, uh, learning the poems by heart and getting them out of prison in a in very complicated way. Uh, his destiny was really very hard. Uh, it could be said that poetry reflects life and life experience, experience and that polit politically exceptional situations are not something that goes against the essence of poetry. But this situation simply represents a condition in which poetry is created. This situation can be normal from the point of view of human rights, but can be also extreme. Uh, in all those situations, the poetry can be written and read. Uh, we can say that every situation is special in its own way. Uh, I am very brief here because that's not my topic today. Uh, the exceptional condition in poetry is related in one respect to the political background. That is, some poets are restricted to the in their possibilities of public expression by political power, while others are not. In the era of communism, uh, some poets were prohibited and some were published. And there is difference which creates not normal state of things in poetry. Uh, but this is a restriction in terms of human rights, not in terms of some poetic rights, if we can speak about something like this, because these poetic rights do not exist or are of a different nature. This, let us say, uh, political, poetic contradiction can destroy or marginalize the work of particular poet, but it is also a possibility that can be exploited in some cases and uh, be the reason of creation of great poetic works. It is also important that the poets themselves reflect on such situations differently, but often perceive and experience them as abnormal. That is from the perspective of citizens, not just poets. We will now be interested in situations where the politically abnormal situation ends, and uh, we return to a sort of normality. Some poets return to normality, but uh, now to a situation that is different from the former state when they published last time. For the poets, I'm going to discuss this return to normality after a longer period of time is associated with old or advanced age. This leads to the question of the status of old age in the field of poetry and especially lyric poetry. Could we also speak of old age uh, from 
slightly different perspective as an exceptional state, given not uh, politically, but naturally? Uh, the answer, of course, is again non, not uh, unequivocal. It's complicated, but it is interesting. Uh, anyway, what is old age? There are general definitions that we find in encyclopedias. There is the definition according to the World Health Organization. There is a given age of retirement, uh, retirement from active life. All these uh, definitions, uh, and especially the last one, are, as we know, variable. In poetry, uh, they all probably come into play. Old age as opposed to youth. Old age as the age when the biological and psychological signs of advanced age become apparent. Uh, the awareness of or feeling of approaching death, and a certain consciousness of time. The accretion of layers of last, the feeling that the time uh, of the past, uh, the feeling that the time is complicated, it's structured in a complicated way, the feeling that the peak of my life belonged to another time, etc. But there are also positive uh, features of uh, old age, especially wisdom, which is, of course, uh, complemented by sort of senility sometimes. And there can be sense of old age as a difference or distance from others, regardless of age. We can also speak of literary old age. The poet may feel kinship with older writers, may be perceived as belonging to an older poetic generation. In these respects, old age is a special condition that sets one apart in terms of social or literary life. But it is not an exceptional condition in the previous, previous political sense. Uh, the exclusion or distance from the center is a natural part of human life. And at the same time, it creates a certain tension because everything gradually shifts towards the old age. Things and phenomena that have a certain meaning and nature in the normal view appear differently from the perspective of the old age. The old person does the same thing, but this, these things suddenly look different. And an example can be old love uh, in Tom Gunn's poem, The Hug. Uh, you probably know the uh, poem. Uh, it's uh, seen fr from uh, the life of older man, and uh, I, I highlighted some, uh, some places, uh, especially uh, this. It was not sex, but I could feel the whole strength of your body set or braced to mine and locking me to you as, we, we, as if we were still 22. Uh, this is situation lived by uh, old or, or older men differently uh, from the, the experience of uh, younger. Uh, I will give a very few examples of poems that can be seen as paradigmatic for the topic of the old age in poetry. There are, of course, many others. And then I will try to organize them a bit. My focus, focus is mainly on modern poetry, leaving aside the old epic and narrative poetry entirely, which would take us uh, too far. There are two axes to work with for a basic categorization. One is the polarity between 
depicting old age and speaking from the perspective of old age. The other, other axis is represented by the scale, character or persona, typically in the third grammatical person, autobiographical speaker, abstract speaker in first person. The examples are not clear cut, of course, but one or the other feature may be dominant in them. First uh, example is from Michelangelo's famous poem, Historic Giuso Comela Midola. Uh, I found only one English translation. Uh, Michelangelo uses, uh, we can say, cadaverous imagination, which is very nicely seen in the first line, but this translation uh, leaves the imagination of uh, bone and marrow aside and uses uh, the image of fruit. I think it's not uh, so close and uh, omits something from, from the poem. Uh, he sees himself as an old man, as if he were in, in a to tomb. Uh, it's carried by uh, a comic hyperbole, shows as old age as a state of material degradation. The artist depict, depicts himself as a decaying corporal form in which the ageless soul is trapped. He then complements his this grotesquely uh, this grotesque contradiction between physical and the spiritual by stating his position on the margins, especially uh, in these highlighted places and uh, in the last uh, stanza where he sees himself aside from, from the art. The second example is from William Wordsworth, uh, his poem, Resolution and Independence from 1802. Uh, uh, he presents a portrait of an old man whom the poet encounters on a walk. Wordsworth shows him as a proud, independent man resigned to his fate. What is interesting, it's Wordsworth's own description of the old man, whom he likens to a great stone, seeing him somewhere on the borderline between life and death, uh, as if uh, this old man were already merging with nature. The encounter is introduced by the speaker's meditation on his own life, when he is no longer a child, uh, but a man. And old age in this poem functions as an image of a state that is distant but at the same time inevitably approaching uh, one of the uh, the often cited poets of the old age is uh, of course yates who is sometimes said to have aged in his youth or uh, that he never uh, was uh, young. Uh, his famous poem, Sailing to Byzantium, uh, begins with the lines, that, with the line, that is no country for old men. Here, too, we can observe a distance from life associated with procreation and change, while marginality or exclusion motivates movement, a journey towards the artistic utopia of Byzantium uh, towards a state where time plays no role. One example from uh, Czech poetry, it's by poet Jan uh, Neruda. His uh, name Neruda was inspiration for uh, more famous poet uh, Pablo Neruda. He, he, took it as his pseudonym. Uh, 
it's from collection Simple Motifs. Uh, oh, and now I'm looking in the mirror. Uh, in this rather comic self-portrait, Neruda uses also the mo motif of old age as a state between life and death. He says, he says I forgot to die once. And he describes himself as an object almost devoid of life. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, watching uh, oneself in, in the mirror as, as rather as object than, uh, than oneself. Uh, typical for uh, this sort of poems. We can notice here one interesting moment, uh, moment uh, or feature for many of the poems of old age. Uh, Neruda sees himself as an old man, but at the same time he speaks from the perspective of an observer untouched by old age. Michelangelo articulated his this doubling as the opposition of body and soul. Yeats projected it into the polarity of this country and the ideal Byzantium. And we discover some type of uh, distance or difference in many other poems about old age. This is not, of course, something unique to poetry. Human can observe himself or herself uh, as a spectator, but poetry accords this observer a voice and this voice appropriates as its own instrument of expression. Here we might say that old age is a special condition in poetry because the frequent speaker of poems, this observer without age, or this observing voice is not bound by age or other features. Only often he or she adapts them, identifies with them in the poem, but it is not, he, but he or she is not identified with them in advance and forever, only temporary. Temporarily. Another example of a similar doubling is nicely given by Czesław Miloš in his poem An honest description of myself with a glass of whiskey at an airport, let us say in Minneapolis. Uh, here, uh, Miloš, uh, as an old man, is looking at young women while watching himself in the same time. Uh, he sums up uh, this in one uh, line. It's not my fault that we are made so half from disinterested contemplation, half from appetite. And we can say that old age is a condition uh, to separate these two roles, the, obs the observer and the uh, person of older age. And uh, this condition is better, of course, in old age than when one is uh, young. To formulate a, a hypothesis, which is not exclusive, but perhaps says something important. In the poems of old age, the lyrical observer is not diminished by age. But age is what she or he observes. Uh, her or his position is characterized by distance, a shift to the periphery from the center of the action, or as in Miloš, an awareness of a certain contradiction between preoccupation and observation. Let us look at uh, Thomas Hardy's poem, Nobody comes from 1924 to conclude this section. 
In this poem, the speaker observes the nocturnal world around him as if uh, it were already close to him as the world was not for him. We can contrast this poem with Rilke's poem entitled Am Rande der Nacht. Rilke uses a similar image, image of a string in the darkness, but his speaker uh, identifies with this musical string of the world in difference of Hardy's uh, speaker, which is in some distance and only observes it. Uh, now I shift to the final and uh, final part of my uh, talk. Again, this general background, which was described very briefly, I would like to introduce some uh, Czech poets. Uh, I have already partially outlined the, the overall political and social situation. The communist regime lasted from uh, 1948 to 1989 in Czech Republic and or in uh, precisely more precisely in former Czechoslovakia uh, and with a certain form of there was a certain form of censorship and prohibition of publication for some writers uh, in the two waves after 1948 and 68, dozens of Czech poets went into exile and many others who remained at home were unable to publish their poems, or rather they published in some is that in a limited range. After 1989, the Czech poetry scene changed considerably, both older and younger poets appeared who had not published before and many of older did not even live to see 1989. The first, uh, the first poet about whom I would like to uh, speak is Ivan Schnedorfer. Uh, he has nice German name. Uh, uh, he died a few months ago. Uh, Ivan Schnerofer published only a few poems in journals before uh, 1968 and his uh, uh, exile. Uh, his, all his work was written in exile and after 1989 he still lived in Canada where he also died. Schneiderfer was a keen observer and in many ways he represents what I have stated. After 1989, he uh, made a trip to Europe and to Czechoslovakia, and he also visited the places where he had lived in his youth. In his collection entitled Return, he recounts a visit to his family home where someone else was living at the time. He walks around the around the house, looks at uh, the places that had, uh, that had changed over the years, and he's uh, finally invited by the actual owner of the house to visit his own house after many years. He speaks uh, with the woman and uh, at the end of this passage of the poem, he sees uh, his own image in the mirror. Uh, and he cannot, uh, uh, he sees uh, himself as a, as a stranger, as a different person. Uh, we have uh, seen that the image in the round mirror to cite it is some stranger's face and not another word now. Now he is silent about it. We have seen that the image of one's own old age creates a sense of difference. However, uh, there is a continuity of time from youth to the situation of old age. The poet is older, 
but it is still him or herself, only changed by the time. In Schneiderfer's case, it is different. The return leads to a different sense of non-identity. Uh, the one who returns after a long time seems to be someone else. The places to which he returns also bear traces of time. And against this background, in the double alienation, he no longer recognizes himself. This more radical alienation can be found in some other poets, though none of them presents as sharp an image as Schneiderfer. Uh, the second poet is uh, Jirina Haukova. She was a member of group uh, 42, one of the key avant-garde groups in Czech literature. Uh, her husband was leading member of uh, the group, critic Jindřich Chalupecký. Uh, he died in 1990, a few months uh, after the uh, fall of communist regime. Haukova officially published poetry until 1970, when a selection of her work was published. In the next two decades, uh, she published several collections in Samizdat and in Exile. She began publishing officially again in uh, 1990. I will focus particularly on her last collection, uh, The Evening Shower or uh, Sprinkle, from uh, 2002. But we can find similar elements uh, in her earlier collections though not as prominently as in this. Haukova expresses a resignation to the outside world as if she wants to withdraw into her own privacy, which is shaped uh, mostly by poetry. Uh, she's very expressive. I don't want to have any more talk with the scabbies in the world. Let them go on killing themselves. My salvation is my writing. It's the only thing that can save me. I don't want anything from anybody. This crusty world scares me. Don't expect anything from anyone. Uh, in her previous work, Haukova often alluded uh, to the bleak ecological situation uh, for which smog uh, was her metaphor. Uh, common Smog was a common phenomenon, especially in 1980s Czechoslovakia. One poem in this collection also bear this title, The Smog. Uh, I think it's more metaphorical, not only description of ecological situation, but of the state of things in all the world. Haukova, Haukova's retreat in her, herself is not an old woman uh, loneliness, but more a kind of anger at an indifferent world that is hurtling towards destruction, hence the titles of poems like Terrorists or the Smog. Uh, present in her poetry is also a sense of approaching death in the poem Conversation with Death. Haukova has developed a distinctive style in her late poetry, where short sections of poems often a single line comes across as an acute aphorism on a particular theme. On the one hand, her late poetry suggests a retreat into seclusion, but on the other, it comments angrily and disappointedly on the world, still having much to say about it. Her clash with the world sounds sounds like a monologue with an audience, a futile speech where no one wants or can listen anymore. For example, at the beginning of the longer poem, Terrorists, notice how uh, almost every line in this poem uh, forms a separate sentence. We have terrorists in the world, not to do but be brave. One is a prince when one writes poetry etc. The world seems to be in total upheaval. 
This is intertwined with the diagnostic observation of uh, the old body. There is costival ointment on my hip. My veins and arteries are fizzing. Uh, and the only refuge again, against this uh, substitute actuality, as she says, is provided by art. Haukova translated modern Anglophone poetry, T.S. Eliot, William Carlos Williams, Dylan Thomas, or Emily Dickinson. Uh, and the motif of the Byzantine Empire, uh, music of the Byzantine Empire, uh, in her poem may well be an allusion to Yeats, to whom her poem is close in uh, its tension between the actual unwitting world and the realm of art. In Haukova's poem, uh, it is further accented uh, by a sense of the approaching end of her own end and also of the, the end of the world, which she sees very apocalyptically. Uh, the last uh, poet is uh, Ivan Givish. Uh, he was, I, I has already, uh, I had already mentioned him. Uh, he was one of uh, the best known Czech poets in 1960s. Uh, then he published about 10 collection and this uh, was also at a time when poetry was read much more uh, widely. So he was well-known uh, person in 1960s Czechoslovakia. After the Soviet occupation of Czechoslovakia in, 19, uh, uh, in August 1968, Divish went to uh, exile. He lived in Munich and did not finally return to the Czech Republic until until shortly before his death in 1997, so two years before his death. Uh, even in exile, uh, he published quite a lot, but this period was very difficult for him personally. He separated from his first wife, who returned to Czechoslovakia with their son, remarried, uh, but fell into alcoholism and suffered from mental illnesses. Uh, in his late work, we can find two basic lines. One is private and intimate. Uh, the other is social, mainly critical. Uh, in some poems, the two merge. Then he experiences history as a sort of personal af affair that results in a kind of almost prophetic style uh, between 1987 and 98, uh, 90, sorry, between 90, uh, 1987 and 89, he wrote a book entitled My Eyes Had to See, which was published in 1991 uh, as one of his first books after the end of communism. Uh, Jewish, uh, it, it is one of books of Givish, uh, Givish, re Givish return to Czech Republic as a, as a poet. From his late work, uh, a collection with the distinctive title, The Old Man, Man's Verses, is worthy to note. Unlike Haukua, uh, Givish as a poet does not adapt the, the attitude of a man who stands uh, aloof or retreats into privacy. On the contrary, he sees himself as one who has the right to judge the nation, one who is still in center of uh, things and is uh, his, his obligation is to speak publicly. Uh, as one uh, that has, uh, who has the right to judge the nation and history. He bases this on his tragically lived personal and historical experience. Uh, the Soviet occupation was his all-life trauma. Uh, 
In, in this book, my eyes had to see, he, he assumes various identities and uh, as a witness gives a kind of cross section of violence, suffering and atrocity in human history from old Mesopotamia to his Czech present. Jewish style is very expressive, full of cruel images, but at the same time, uh, uh, he speaks in a very terse language with a specific humor. Uh, today we could say that Jewish style is sometimes sometimes unpleasant in a way, uh, that it is incorrect and ruthless. Uh, the opening section of the poem starts with uh, this this line, I am the princess and queen Shuba. Uh, this is example of uh, the changing identity of the speaker of, of the poem. So uh, this is starting monologue by the Sumerian queen Shuba. It introduces a love scene with the king and ends with the queen's death. I am the princess and queen Shuba, and so on. And very briefly after this uh, love scene, which uh, alludes to song of uh, songs, uh, she or he start to speak. One day I started to lose weight. Within a month, I had a mouthful of sand. And it uh, finishes with. Uh, the speech of that queen. At the end of the passage, when the dead queen speaks, shows well Jewish style in this book. The poet speaks taking, taking on an alien identity, but in the same time remaining, remaining that untimely voice outside the events. We saw it in this distinction between old man or woman and the observer. The display of violence and perversities culminates in, in the 20th century. The title phrase, my eyes had to see, is repeated many times throughout the coll collection in several forms, my eyes had to see or my eyes saw, etc. As if it were impossible to escape these horrors. Here too, we, uh, the, the acceptance of alien identities is manifested down to the smallest sensory detail. Uh, this is another citation uh, from the poem. My eyes saw Himmler peering through the gas chamber window, saw him being carried to the infirmary. They saw helicopter pilots for hire circling over Matogrosso, so on. They saw a boy in the Ukraine. They saw the sun. So uh, the final citation uh, is more personal. My eyes must saw Jindřich Chalupetsky grabbing me by the sleeve on the National Ave Avenue and saying, please don't drink. The last poet, I would like to mention to present uh, is Bohumila Gregorová, uh, who is very different from all the poets I, uh, I have spoken about. Uh, her works uh, represent different position. Uh, uh, Gregorová was for many years an author, translation, uh, create, created uh, Auto translator duo with Josef Hirschal. They wrote experimental poetry in uh, the 60s and were active participants on the international scene. They were well known in the community of experimental poets in 60s, from 60s to 80s, I think. Of. When we read uh, their records, from the 60s, we encountered the atmosphere of an 
intense literary life full of international contacts, travels and uh, publication. It was a very intensive period, period for them. All this ended in 1968, although there were still some contacts with the German milieu, for example, uh, both of them wrote experimental radio plays for German radio. Uh, my colleague uh, Pavel uh, Novotny wrote this uh, interesting book uh, about acoustical literature, where he uh, writes about Ferdinand Privet, for example, but also about uh, Gregorova and uh, Hirschel. Uh, if for a long time uh, the duo Hirschel Gregorova was mentioned, after 1989, the order reversed and Gregorova becomes one of the most known Czech poets. And today we say rather Gregorova and Hirschel than Hirschel and Gregorova. Uh, she started to be well known just in her old age. Some of earlier texts and translation by both poets are published in uh, 90s, but Gregorova begins to publish her own works in this at this time. Poetic prose influenced by the experiment and poetry. The end of her life and work is marked by, uh, by the gradual loss of her sight. However, Gregorova is type of optimistic and playful poet till her end, as if she still experimented with the language and life as well. Uh, I would like to mention the book manuscript. Uh, here, uh, her failing eyesight became the starting point for her writing. Uh, this quotation uh, here uh, in the bottom starts the book, March 206, inspection at the ophthalmology of the military hospital, diagnosis, practically blind on both sides. I will present a short uh, film uh, about uh, Gregorova and she starts, uh, opens, opens the film with precisely this, this citation. Uh, she wrote, uh, this poetic, uh, this 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 uh, this uh, this poems uh, in lar large letters from memory because she uh, couldn't uh, see what uh, she uh, writes and her friends transcribed them after her. For some of the poems, earlier versions were published and they show how she reduced the line sometimes, uh, stripping away personal laments and concentrating on observation and recognition of the state of things. The whole book is a fascinating description of a world that gradually turns into a kind of misty space from which voices come, vague outlines of things and people and mingle with memories and visions. Life goes on as fully as before, but its content has changed considerably. Uh, th this is really fascinating that uh, she never says that, uh, uh, that she is old and it's bad, but uh, she still experiences new world as she uh, can, uh, can see and touch it. This can be seen, for example, in the passages devoted to writing or where books are recalled that have now lost their meaning. The books turn mute, ex Gregorova, as Gregorova writes. I am sitting in the front of the library again, which book to choose and so on. Uh, what? its title, the title of the book. Uh, it won't answer any more questions. It's close to me, close to me. 
I sit in front of the library of mute books. Uh, the book can be read as a record, as an exploration, but also as an exercise in which one becomes physically familiar with a transformed world. In many examples, we have seen that old age means retreat to the margins. But in Gregorová case, it is a little different. Her fascination with the world is still present. For example, she let her friends read the books to her about contemporary physical theories. In her poetry, it seems that the reader is more on the edge and the center has shifted elsewhere. The center has shifted where the poet is. Uh, here are some citations uh, from the book with which I uh, finish my talk. Uh, there is motive of, of the fog into the world was changed and from this in different space, some fragments of shapes uh, comes into the vision. There is a motive of writing with uh, with uh, great letters. Uh, uh, this, this, this passage is very nice uh, when she speaks about uh, her uh, room as a, a sort of wilderness, where, which is very dangerous because she, she is blind. Uh, and still there is a motive of writing. I long for a pencil, for paper. It should be lined. Shall I see the lines? The pencil must have a thick point. I will write in block letters. I can't read the handwriting even under a strong uh, magnifying uh, glass. Who will read it? And so on. And this, this is the poem about the library. Uh, if, if you agree, I, I will show you uh, uh, some uh, pa passages from the film about her at the end of, of my talk. Uh, <laughs> He is writing now. Kontrola na očním oddělení vojenské nemocnice. Diagnosis of blindness. Diagnoze. Prakticky slepota obou straně. Mlha se choulí. Den za dnem, týden za týdnem houstne. Deru se deru z mlhy ven nadarmo. Obrůstá mlhou ze všech stran. Potřebují knihu a číst. Potřebují tušku a psát. Kniha v mlze. Papír, tuška i ruka v mlze. Civím, jsem v pasti. Kam se zadívám? Kaše z šedozelených perliček. Uh, this is the poem I cited in my presentation. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Gregorová uh, used kaleidoscope to looking uh, in. He could, she, sorry, she could see something in kaleidos kaleidoscope, not uh, not in the normal view from from the window. It's uh, there are some. Matematiky v Brně, vysoké matematiky, a ta by mě vypočtla. Když jí řeknu, kolik je tam těch korálků, tak ona mě vypočte, možná, já nevím, možná mě vypočte. Kdy se to může opakovat, jaká je možnost, že... And finally, uh, there is passage where she... Uh, Writes, 
we can see her with magnifying glass. Uh, she cannot read, uh, but uh, she couldn't read, but uh, she uh, heard uh, some uh, audio books in uh, German sent her from Switzerland. Vůbec usnout. Já si to nemůžu vynachválit. Denně to poslouchám dvě hodiny, jak milé je tma. Vracím se do dětství prostě, což je v 90. tak celá přirozený, že jo? I kam jinam. Protože do hrobu jako ještě se mi nechce, teda. To nemůžu říct. Ale do toho dětství se mi chce, protože bylo krásný. A teď já to pořád musím dělat jakoby zpětně a musím, se, musím to skončit svým narozením. Uh, here she uh, speaks about her return to childhood. Uh, she did some, she wrote some experimental prose, which starts in at present and goes uh, gradually to, to her childhood and also before her birth. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, she is very, she was very uh, inspiring person, especially in her old age. So here I will finish and thank you for the patience with my lecture. I hope it was in some points interesting for you. So, Joseph, thank you very much. It was really interesting for all of us. And I hope we can see you again and have another presentation and maybe have another person from your department too, uh, to have some more presentations on Czech poetry. Um, I'm so sorry that we have uh, only a few presentations about other Slavic languages and literatures, and um, there should be more about Czech. <laughs>